Catholic Church. Happy spring in Minnesota. It's probably snowing outside. But what happens in the spring? The twins start playing baseball. I get pretty pumped about that. We, Renew Church, we're planning a church road trip to the Target Field, downtown Minneapolis, June 23rd. It's a Thursday noon game. So, you know, tell your boss you're taking a day off that day. You're, you know, don't want you playing hooky, but to get a vacation day ahead of time. We're going to get the van loaded up. I'm pretty sure that's going to be a go. Pretty excited about that. And uh, we'll, I think we got like 40 tickets reserved. And uh, we're going to have a clipboard sign up. And uh, tickets with taxes and fees and everything, we got tickets for $6.50. You can't beat that. Yeah, they're out in the upper seats, but to get into a Twins game for six fifty, come on. All right, who, if you want to go, sign up on the clipboard, let us know. Let's have a fun church event down and go Twins. All right, here we go. How's your week been? Good. Good? It's, good? it's good to be here. I tell you what, it's good to see your faces. I love that. No matter, no matter how my week has been, good or bad, difficult, um, when I get here and you guys start to come to church, it lifts up my soul. Do you guys feel that? Yeah. It just, it's so encouraging. And yet, sometimes I'm tempted, and I especially, of course, now as I'm a pastor, what's up there, son? Oh yeah, if you know if you got kids or if you're in junior high youth group, head on back, give my son a hard time, make him earn his four hundred dollars a month, which is not much, but make him earn it. So, head on back there. Um, so, anyways, I remember before. No, it's hard for me to skip church because I'm a pastor. Um, but I was tempted when I wasn't a pastor. Every once in a while, like I love going to church, I love the people, but every once in a while, it's nice to take a night off, right? Don't all look at me like, no, I would never skip church. Like I know some of you skip church. I've seen you skip in church, so. Um, but I mean, I get it. There's times where, you know, I'm like, you know, uh, especially football season when I used to be so into the Vikings, and I still am, but um, I would be like, you know what? I've gone to church eight weeks in a row and I'll stay home today and watch some football and God won't condemn me. And he doesn't, by the way. But then after I would be like, yeah, I should have went to church and, you know, I, I, I feel guilty. But I tell you what, the times that I didn't want to go, but I ended up going, I'm always like, now why would I ever even consider skipping church, right? Is that how y'all feel? Praise God. So, hey, there's some pretty good things. I know I'm not going to get into it, but God is beginning to do great things here. Three weeks in a row, we've had a nice attendance bump. We're seeing trends. Things are going the right direction. This week, I'm excited because this week, I'm heading down. I'm not getting a day off this week. I'm going to say that again. And this time after, I want you to be like, oh, you ready? Uh, heading down the cities, I'm not taking a day off this week. No, 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 no. It's supposed to be sorrow and empathy and, and all that. So, um, so I'm not going to day off this week, but I tell you what, I don't care because you know what I'm going to go down and do in the city? Does anybody know what's happening this week? Free. We're aligned with Evangelical Free Network. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. So that's that next step for us. And I tell you what, after that happens, we're still working out kinks in our systems, things that we got to get better at before God will send more people, check in, small group. But anyways, after E-Free, you know what the next big push is that I'm really excited for? Anybody know? Morgan Park move. Morgan Park move. Amen. Like, who's excited for that? That's going to be a game changer. <laughs> So it's been God. God's been doing great things. So uh, contrary to popular belief out there in some minds, uh, we're making it, praise God, and we're doing well. So thank you. Now I want to get to tonight's message, but let's, uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. Lord, I, I want to just leave our baggage at the door. Father, I want to have an open heart and mind for what you have. And those distractions can be so many different things. We come in here with baggage, and some of that baggage, Father, is theological baggage, things that we struggle to believe, even though it's clearly in your word. But, Father, we want to always want to empty ourselves of all that and just really hear what your word says and what your spirit speaks to us. I pray that we come out here challenged, encouraged, growing in our faith and in our knowledge, and that we would leave here and take that knowledge out to the world like we've called to be it and be a light. So, Lord, once again, speak to us right now through your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Is anybody uh, excited to learn something tonight, to get some truth? Okay, I hope that you are. Uh, here's the thing, and I believe this with all my heart. I don't care how bad of a preacher might be, right? 
okay? Um, I don't think your ability to grow has anything to do with the preacher's ability. Like, we want to do a good job. We want to get better. But I think it comes down to your heart. If you have a heart to learn, God's going to meet you there. You see, a lot of people say things like, you know, I'm not being fed by this. I'm not being fed by that. But I tell you, most of the times when we're not being fed, it's because we have a heart issue. But if you come to church with a heart, mind, ready to receive, I think that you're going to grow. And I hope that we will today. So going back to the book of 1 John, because we had, you know, our Resurrection Sunday service last weekend. And last time we're in the book of 1 John, what we had looked at was John makes a statement eight times in the book, and it was, by this we know. Five chapters, only 101 verses, eight times that comes up. Now, of course, as you kind of know, we, we use that statement, by this we know, to establish a point. And basically what we're saying is one thing confirms the genuineness of another. In order for this to be true, then this will be the result. So what John is saying to us is that, hey, if it is true that you're walking with Christ, then this is what your life will look like, right? Pretty clear stuff. So that's where we were at last time. And what John is saying, if you're a spirit-filled Christian, if you are saved, the result of your life will be these eight things. I'm just saying if you have those eight things frequently, then you can be assured you're a child of God. But if you don't have those eight things, then you might want to re-examine your life. The eight things he discussed, he said, is by this we know, one was that we know God, two, that we abide in God, that we belong to God, that we are loving, that we are of the truth, that we love other Christians, and that we know the difference between truth from error, and that we are discerning. And so those are the eight things that he kind of covered. Now this week we'll pick it up at the end of chapter three. I'm going to read it, and then we'll break it down. So you're welcome if you take out your Bible there, but I think most of you uh, either don't take it out or look at your phone, but here's what we're going to read today. It says this. My little children, let's not love in word and tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this, we will know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. If our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God that whatever we ask from him, we receive because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is the commandment, that we should believe on the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he's given us a commandment. Now he who keeps God's commandments abides in God and God in him, and by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. So I want to break that down. What does that mean for you and I? Well, one of our key things here, you all look on the wall, see the posters there? If you've got our new pamphlets, you know, we want to keep reminding, like we, we've narrowed the bullseye. And, and what it is, we, we're, there's four things that we want to prioritize. And one of them, we always want to make a priority is new growth. I don't care how long you walk with Jesus, you should always be growing, right? And so every time that you come here and you hear a message, that's an opportunity if your heart is right to grow. You could leave here and say, man, I grew today. I grew in my faith. And here's the thing, if you grow in your faith and you grow in your knowledge, that will lead to new stories. New stories of life change and transformation, things like that. And so right now, today, we can begin to fulfill two of those points. Um, I saw some new faces today, too, by the way. So that's three things we've accomplished today. Amen? Amen. So I want to break down verses 19 and 20. And this is where we left off. He said, and by this, we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before God. But if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows all things. He said, hey, you can have assurance Okay, if you're not feeling condemned, but he goes on to say, but if you, if you do feel condemned in your heart, God is greater and he knows all things. So what does that mean? Okay. What does John mean when he says, hey, you know, if you feel condemned, if you feel shameful or guilty, you know what? Don't worry about it. Don't sweat it. God loves you because Christ died for you. So no worries. Is that what John means? The answer to that is yes and no. See, I'm a good politician. No matter, you can't corner me. I got an out here in this one. So the answer to that is, is that what John's mean? Well, the answer to that is yes and no. Unfortunately, this verse has often been ripped out of context to the detriment of many people. They'll isolate that one verse and they'll ignore everything else that John said. And that's a bad, a bad practice. Not only is that a bad practice when you read your Bible, but that's a bad practice when it comes to life, right? How many of you guys have found that it's okay just to listen to part of your wife's conversation? No, it doesn't end well. So we know that context is important. 
So I want to take a closer look here at what that means. What does it mean when he says, if you feel ashamed, if you're condemned or guilty, if you feel bad? Um, does he say, you know what, no matter what, no matter how you're living, don't worry about it because God's bigger than that. Um, but sometimes that bad feeling that we have is not something to ignore. Did you know that? Sometimes God wants people to feel guilty. Did you know that? Sometimes God wants people to feel bad. Because that's the Holy Spirit warning us. And it's his act of love towards us. Now I'm going to say that again because I know that people will disagree with me. But I want to say this. If you disagree with me, just know that you don't have God's word on your side. I'm like, you can disagree with me. But you're not disagreeing with me who you're really disagreeing with. You're disagreeing with God, right? So I'm going to say it again. Um, sometimes God wants people to feel guilty, condemned, and shamed. Did you know that? Now, I, I just know the thoughts like, no, no, I, not shame. That doesn't sound right. That doesn't resonate with me. Well, once again, my opinion doesn't mean anything. Let's look at the word of God. Okay. Now, I will say this. There are some times where people feel guilty, and they should. But there are other times where there are people that struggle to believe that God loves them and forgives them. They feel bad, and they shouldn't. Okay. So here's the thing. How do we know when we're feeling condemned if it's God or not, how do we begin to differentiate so we know, is that just guilty feelings? Is that the devil lying to me? Or is that the Holy Spirit poking me? Have you ever struggled with that at times to know which one's which? If you've never wrestled with that, then there's a problem in your faith because you should. You should wrestle with that at times. Sometimes in life, if we ignore signs or symptoms, it can have devastating results. Because the, the symptoms in our life are pointing to something that needs to be addressed. Something is not right in your life, not healthy. In fact, sometimes those symptoms can be pointing to something life-threatening. Consider doctors, right? Let's pretend that, uh, and this is true. I know this is true. There are people out there that, that have been really sick. And some people that have even died because they ignored warning signs. Maybe they were having shoulder pain. They feel lightheaded. They feel nauseous. You know, it could be a sign of a heart condition, right? Probably shouldn't ignore that because it could lead to death. I know that's happened to me a few times. I had that bad headache, uh, cold, frustrated thing. It was going on for like seven weeks. You know, and my family's like, you should just stop being a stubborn idiot and go to the hospital, you know? And uh, I'm like, oh, I'm fine. It's just a cold. And, you know, and I'm drinking NyQuil. And then finally, after seven weeks, I went in and I had a sinus infection, you know? And so how many times in life do we ignore things that we shouldn't? Has anybody ever ignored a health symptom and later on realized that was something serious in their life? See, I got some hands there, right? So we get that. Well, here's the thing. Don't ignore the signs and symptoms in your life. And sometimes there are spiritual warning signs that God has given you. There are spiritual warning signs in your life that something is not right. And sometimes that warning sign is you feeling guilty or feeling condemned. That is God trying to get your attention like, hey, I love you, but I'm trying to tell you that your life is not in a good place. You shouldn't ignore that. So here's what I'm going to look at. I'm going to look at times that God wants people to feel shame and guilt and condemnation. And the reason why I'm going to start there, because that's not fun, but I just know, because I know the culture that we live in, and the Bible says that we want to gather people around us to teach us what we want to hear. I mean, I love hearing good things. I mean, I love when people are, you know, um, I love... You know, you're amazing. Your preaching's the best. You're not fat. You're, you're so handsome. And who cares about not having hair? Like, that's what I want to hear. Okay? But, uh, but you know what? It's not true. I am overweight, and I am bald, and, you know, I'm not the best preacher. I get that. So, I know that people struggle with this idea that God would really, at times, want us to feel guilty. But that's not what God's Word teaches Here's how we'll start there. One of the works of the Holy Spirit, did you know that one of the things that the Holy Spirit does in our life in this world is to convict people of sin? Did you know that? That's one of the primary jobs of the Holy Spirit is to convict people of their sin. And that word in the Greek, now listen to the details of this. That Greek word for convict means this. Taken right out of the Bible, to feel wrong, to feel shameful, to bring into the light, to expose, to find fault with, to correct, to call into account, to show one his faults, to demand an explanation, to chide, admonish, reprove, to chasten, to punish, and listen to this last one, and to reprehend severely. He's saying when the Holy Spirit comes to convict, that's what he's going to do. That's one of the Holy Spirit's job, 
is to convict us. So here's it, and here it is right there. When the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Has the Holy Spirit, by the way, come? Anybody know if the Holy Spirit is on this earth now? Yes, he is. And so one of the things he's going to do, he can comfort you. He can lift you up. He can set you free. He can give you power over sin. But sometimes he's going to come and he's going to correct you and convict you. In fact, the Bible says that if you have never been convicted or corrected by God, it actually is a sign that you're not a child of God. Did you know that? Because whom he loves, he, he corrects. So that's one of the Holy Spirit's jobs. So when we say, God wouldn't want to do that. First of all, the Holy Spirit is doing that and the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit at times is making people feel guilty because of sin in their life. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. And according to 1 Thessalonians, if you ignore that, you're actually ignoring God himself. I'm just going to tell you right now, it's not wise to ignore God, right? Like, it's just not a good practice. I also want to say this. If you do feel that, God is not doing that because he's mean. He's doing that because he loves you. Okay? He's trying to help you. He cares about you. Now, the way that we know that people at times should feel guilty is because we all have a conscience. Did you know that? Romans chapter 2 says this. It says in Romans 2 that when unbelievers who do not have God's law, basically like unbelievers don't have the word of God. So they're not reading the Bible like we do. He said, but even though they don't have that, they have a conscience that shows the work of God's law written on their hearts. And their conscience will bear witness and their thoughts will accuse them. Did you hear that? The thoughts are going to accuse them. The thoughts are going to just deep inside. There's going to be a part of you like, I think you can sear your conscience. If you do the wrong thing long enough, it won't feel bad anymore. You ever done that? Okay. But do you remember when you first started doing the wrong thing? You kind of felt guilty. I shouldn't, you know, I shouldn't do that. Maybe that's wrong. You sneak around. You feel guilty. That's your conscience telling you right there. He's trying to tell you like, hey, that's not good. It's trying to tell you that something is not right in your life. Now, listen to this, because to me, this is the most powerful statement of shame and guilt meant to love somebody. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We have talked about this a lot. But the Apostle Paul did this intentionally. He intentionally wanted a person to feel really bad about their life choices. Now, this is probably not an approach we take in modern-day Christianity, wouldn't it? We find somebody gripped in sin, and we say, oh, they just need to know how much God loves them, which, by the way, he does. He loves you more than you can imagine. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, here's what Paul, speaking to the man that was living in sexual sin, and he wants him to feel bad. So here's what he says to him, okay? He talks about this man's caught in sexual sin. You can read it right there for yourself. He said, you're full of pride. By the way, he, he's talking to these Christians that aren't trying to address this. He said, you, you got pride that you're ignoring this. He said that you're full of pride and you haven't wept, that he who's done this will be removed from the church community, deliver him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his soul might be saved. Right now, he's not saved. He's a lost person because of his life. So basically what he's saying is, you know what, don't eat with them. It goes on at the end of the chapter, he says, don't even eat with that person, have nothing to do with them, and hopefully that will create some shame that will lead to repentance and change behavior. Right? So that's the first letter. Paul is writing him like, hey, what's going on? I'm hearing this story. You got some goofy things happening in your church. I, I don't know why you're allowing this. Now, in his second letter, here's the follow-up to that man that he was trying to get to feel bad. Okay? This is the follow-up to it. Paul says this. Okay? So he hears the story. They kick the guy out of church, basically. Hopefully they did it in love and gentleness, but they ask him, like, hey, you can't be here. You're not right with God. And, uh, and now the man does that. He feels bad. He changes his life. Paul said, if I made you sorry with my letter, I don't regret it. Ooh, could you imagine if I said that to you when I made you upset? I'm sorry if I made you upset, but I'm actually not sorry. I don't regret that you're mad at me. Like, you would lose your mind at me, wouldn't you? Let's be honest. I know some of you would. When Paul says, I, I don't feel sorry that I, that I made you feel bad. Okay, here's why. He said, I don't regret it, though it's hard to write to people that I love. Because he's addressing, like, it's hard to rebuke people you care for. For I perceive that my letter made you sorry, but only for a while. Now I rejoice that you were made sorry, and that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss in nothing. So what does Paul mean when he says, hey, I don't want you to suffer loss in anything? He's not talking about worldly things. He's talking about eternal things. He's saying eternity is far more important than your, your comfort right now. That's what he's saying. 
And he continues, and here's what he said. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. And so what he's saying is one is repentance, or basically repentance, and one is regret. See, you can regret things. It doesn't mean you're repentant. You know, I regret a lot of things I did because I had to pay the consequences. You all get that? You ever been there? You know? But if I could do it over and not get caught, I probably would have. Big difference. So he said this, saying, For I observed this very thing that you saw it in a godly manner. What diligent it produced, what clearing of yourself, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what vindication in all things you proved yourself to be clear on the matter. He's like, you vindicated and you cleared yourself. What does he mean? Well, here's what Paul is saying. We ask you to leave the church. You realize what you're doing was really inappropriate. You began to address those issues in your life. You were sorry. You repented and you changed. And because you changed, you're no longer under condemnation. Now, God has restored you. You are clear of your sin. But it all started, they wanted him to what? Feel bad. Because it was the feeling bad that changed him. Can I get an amen on that? That's not a popular preaching topic today, is it? But it's right out of the word of God. And it's all over, actually. He wanted the man in sexual sin to feel bad. Now, it wasn't just feeling bad for the sake of feeling bad, but he cared for his soul because he realized if he died in that condition, he's lost. If he died that way, he would become the fulfillment of Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus say, I don't know you, depart from me, you practice sin. Paul realizes that. He's like, man, I care too much for that guy. I'm going to do whatever I can because I want him in heaven with me. You know, sometimes when we, when we need to realize that sometimes we feel bad in our life, but sometimes we see people that are feeling bad, and, you know, sometimes we try to rescue them and we're actually working against the Holy Spirit. Did you know that? The Holy Spirit's like, what are you trying to do? I'm trying to break this person. And you're trying to justify them in ungodly behaviors. And we're not actually loving them when we do that. We're actually holding their hand on the way to hell. Is that nice? No, like, I don't want to do that. So there's that. And that's why we have to self-examine because the Bible says we self-examine now in this life that we can judge ourselves now and get things right. So, well, I know what someone argue, and I hear that 1 John chapter 4 says that we can have boldness in the day of judgment because Christ is, so are we in the world. And then it goes on to say this, there is no fear in love because perfect love casts out all fear because fear involves torment. He who fears has not been perfected in love. So I can hear right now all the people saying, That's not, that can't be true, Rob, because 1 John says that God doesn't want us to have fear because fear is not love. First of all, you can't use one verse to ignore another verse, can you? It's not which one's more right than the other. It's about how do we get them to fit together. So we have to do that here. So some would argue that fear and condemnation go hand in hand. And since God loves us, he wouldn't want us to feel that way because there's no fear in love. But there's a condition that he said right there. He said, we can have boldness because Christ was in the world, so are we. Do you hear what he said there? If you are living the way Christ lived in the world, then yeah, you can have confidence. But if you're not living the way Christ lived, can you have that same boldness? No. That's what he's saying. I think we also have to remember, too, that it says that if you have been perfected in love. Another key to that verse there, but if you've been perfected, if you truly love God, one of the things that we see in Scripture, that somebody who's truly perfected in God's love will have a desire to please God and obey God. You can't separate that out. So if you really have perfected in God's love, one of the desires in you will be like, I want to please the Father and obey the Father. And if you're obeying God and trying to please God, you're not going to be habitually you know, rebelling against him. And so that's another thing to consider. So here's how it goes hand in hand. Uh, I love the song Amazing Grace. There's some good theology in there. You know, grace taught my heart to what? Fear. And then grace taught, and then fear, you know, was relieved. So it started with fear, and then eventually fear relieved. So what does that mean? Here's what it means. They started off being afraid of God. Because they're afraid of God, they corrected their life. And once they corrected their life, they had nothing to fear. See how that works? Some would say, that sounds like works righteousness. No, that's not it at all. It says in Galatians chapter 5 that if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under God's law. And I'll just say this. None of us want to be under God's law. We don't. We want to be under grace. We want Jesus' blood applied to our lives. But he says, if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. But he also said that if you're led by the Spirit, you're not going to do what? 
fulfill fleshly things. So those two go hand in hand. So what does that mean? That if I'm led by the Spirit, I'm not under law. Does that mean if I'm a Christian, it doesn't matter, I don't have to worry about the law? No, here's what it means. It means if you're a Christian, you'll do the right thing and you won't have to worry about the law. Prime example, if I'm running down the drive down the road, now, now I've been a law abiding citizen for a while, but there's times in my life where I had no car insurance. Um, I think I've drove before in my past where I didn't have a valid driver's license. Can anybody relate to that? Some of you know you have raised your hands and joined the club with me, so, okay? So we've, just, we've done it before, right? I don't know why that's froze up there. Want to go to slide 12 for me, please? Thank you. And so um, here's how that works for us. If we're driving down the road, I have a valid driver's license, my tabs are good, my car is fine, my headlights work, and I'm driving the speed limit, and here comes a cop right behind me, he's got no power over me. He can't do anything because I haven't broke the law, right? But if I start to break the law, now suddenly I have to fear the law and I become under the law. What he's saying is if the Spirit of God is leading you, you're going to be obedient to God's law, therefore it has no power to you. Does that make any sense? That's exactly what he's teaching here. Now listen to this. We talk about fear and not fear. And this is reinforced in Romans chapter 13 when it talks about government. It says, whoever resists government or resists the laws of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For these authorities don't create fear for those that are doing good works but to evil. He's saying, hey, if you're doing the right thing, you've got nothing to worry about. Here's what I don't understand. We're all worried about our privacy in America. I don't want the government mingling in my life. I don't want the government knowing what I do and what I look at. That's none of their business. I got nothing to hide. The government can look at whatever they want, okay? Because I'm not afraid because I'm not doing anything illegal. Can I get an amen on that one, people? In fact, I kind of wish they'd look into my life a little bit <laughs> because maybe they would find out about Jesus. You want to see my search history? Go ahead. You'll probably get bored, <laughs> you know? But I got nothing to hide, right? So that's what they're saying here is if you're doing the right thing, then you've got nothing to worry about. But it goes on to say this. For these authorities don't create fear for those that do good, but for those that are evil. He said, if you don't want to be afraid of authority, then do what's right. If you're doing the right thing, you ain't got nothing to worry about. He said, but if you do evil, be afraid. He does not bear the sword in vain, for he's God's minister to execute judgment on those who practice sin and evil. Once again, if you're doing the right thing, you don't have to be afraid. But if you're doing the wrong thing, sometimes God wants us to feel a little afraid. And here's another thing that we have to consider when we talk about what John said, that perfect love casts out all fear. You can't quote John and also ignore everything else that John said, right? Because he said a lot of other challenging things in this text. And here's what I think that we do. We've got to get away from this in American Christianity. It happens all the time. We'll take two verses that seem to be maybe a counterbalance or maybe a contradiction, although they're not. We'll look at something like, for example... Um, the verses about fearing God, which, by the way, are all over the New Testament. You all know that? In fact, Jesus said, I'll tell you whom you should fear. Our culture hears this. They hear Jesus say, oh, don't worry, because I came on earth, you have nothing to fear. <laughs> That's not what he said. So we'll take the, the fear God verses, but then we'll take the God loves you verses, and then we will just incline ourselves to whatever we like. But let me ask you, we should fear God, and God does love you. Which verse is more truthful? They're both truthful, but we tend to ignore one or the other, whichever fits us, and that is dangerous and bad. Feeling God allows us to feel guilt at times. It's an act of love. Uh, I, I would use this analogy. You ever have a, remember when kids start to crawl around, they get into everything, it's like dangerous. Uh, your once peaceful house is now like a landmine of danger. They're grabbing everything. Like, I remember Liz one time, we thought, we like, the house is clean. She won't find anything. A couple minutes later, she's got thumbtack in her mouth. I'm like, where did that come from? You guys remember that, kids? You ever have a kid try to stick their finger in the outlet? Okay. Our kids did. That was last week. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it was Christian. And we're like, go for it, Christian. Give it a shot. See how that works. No, I'm just kidding. So, you know, the kid's about to put the finger in the outlet. Now, when they're a toddler, I can't sit down and say, well, let me explain to you about electricity and how that works and the human body and what's that. So, like, it's just lost on a toddler, right? But I can't ignore that because I love my child and grandchild. There's only one thing that I can probably do at that age, slap the hand. You everybody ever slap your kid's hand? I'm going to, child protection agency is going to come get me now, okay? Because that's the only thing. So you slap the hand. No. And then the kid cries because it doesn't hurt. You know why the kid cries? Mom and dad's upset with me. 
But that is a dangerous action. And feeling bad is what's going to be the safeguard to protect them. And sometimes us feeling bad is God's safeguard to protect us from things that can hurt us. But we don't want to feel bad. I'll tell you, sometimes we need to feel bad. Okay? Sometimes the Holy Spirit makes us feel bad. He's trying to get our attention to protect us. Okay? But now there are other times where you feel bad and you shouldn't. Because the devil likes to accuse us. So that's where it's hard to differentiate. That's why you have to know the Word of God. Okay? But I want to give you some other examples in Scripture that clearly show that there's a time where God wants people to feel guilt and shame and condemnation. And that people that are in that condition are in jeopardy and they need to wake up. Here's one right there. If anyone does not obey the word of God, do not keep company with him that he might feel ashamed. There's John chapter 3. It says that um, they are condemned already because they hate the light and refuse to come into it. Romans chapter 8 says that there's no condemnation those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but the spirit. So it gives us a condition there to not feeling condemned. But if you're not walking according to the spirit, then you've got condemnation. 1 Timothy chapter 5 says this. It's referring to widows in the church. He said they have turned to worldly desires. They have condemnation because they cast off their first faith. Then there's Jude chapter 1. And this is referring to men that are in church community. It's not unbelievers. It says certain men have crept into the church unnoticed, long ago marked out for condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of God into an opportunity to live in sin and deny Jesus. So in those cases, he's saying they are condemned, and I tell you what, they should feel condemned. So how do we know if the condemnation, shame, or guilt is something to ignore and just feel fine trusting that God loves us and that he knows our hearts? Or when is the time that's a wake-up call that we should pay attention to? Because that's the key. I think we've clearly established that at times we should feel bad. Well, one, here's how you can tell. Context is key. Before John said that, he gave eight he gave eight statements by this we know. And he also gave many other evidences in the book. So he lays out assurance if we are or if we aren't a child of God. So here's what he's saying. If you have those evidences that preceded that verse, if you have those evidences, right? And if you still feel bad, even though you look at your life and think, wait a second, I'm not perfect, but I'm not practicing sin. I love my brother. These sort of things. If that's your case and you're fulfilling the word of God, you're fine. What you need to do in a case like that, if you're obeying God the best that you can, is disregard your subjective feelings and trust the word of God that affirms that God loves you and you're okay. Because your feelings will mess you up. There'll be a time in your life where you are living as a rebellion to God and you're going to feel fine and you are not. And then there's other times where you'll feel condemned because the devil is lying to you and you're just fine. But you got to know the Word of God really well and compare your life to that. So if you have those evidences, man, then don't worry about what you feel. God loves you. Go to bed at night and trust Jesus. But if you don't have those evidences, then maybe the guilt that you're feeling is God trying to give you a wake-up call. Y'all track with me tonight? Cool. Let us continue. John said, let's not love in word and tongue, but in actions and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and will assure our hearts before him. If our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. So that assurance that we have is not subjective feelings, but the evidence that John lays out. If you love in truth and in actions, that's what assures your heart. Okay? If you have those evidence, take confidence. But if you don't, be concerned. Because your actions are showing the work of God's spirit in your life or not. So don't trust feelings. Trust in the word of God. That has to be our measuring stick. And how do we know that John's given us conditions? Well, here's why we know. Because right after that statement, he gets into something else that's condition-based. Here's what it is. If our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. Whatever we ask in prayer, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. So right there, he comes up with two more conditions. Like, hey... If you ask in prayer, God's going to give it to you if you keep his commandments and do what's pleasing to him. Now, that's related to prayer. He's saying if you don't feel condemned, then you can have confidence when you pray. Now, here's why that's so important. Why confidence is connected to answered prayer. Okay? 
there's one condition that I can think of. There's many conditions, but one that pops up that's specifically connected to having effective prayer. And if you want to pray effectively, you have to pray this way. And here's what it is. Anybody know? Father in heaven? Yeah, that's one, yeah. Uh, fervent prayer is one, yeah. That's actually, you know, um, but the other one I was thinking about is in faith. There's a lot of things we should pray, but the one thing he did say is pray in faith. Let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave driven tossed by the wind. For not let that man suppose he receive any him from God. He's double-minded and stable in all his ways. So he's saying if you want to ask God for something, you've got to do it with confidence. And here's how somebody who's living in sin can ask in confidence. And I want you to be honest and relate to me. Have you ever prayed for something in your life? You know, like I've prayed for things full well while I know that I'm in rebellion to God. Y'all, anybody ever done that? Like, you know there's something in your life that's probably not right, but you pray. I see this a lot with guys used to be in prison, right? They, 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 uh, they want nothing to do with God, but now they're going to prison, and they're suddenly praying. God, help me this. God, help me that. God, help me. Knowing full well. So there can be a time in our life where we're praying, God, I want you to help me with this. God, help me with that. God, I need finances. God, whatever, I need this. But in the back of our mind, you know that there's sin in your life. You know that you've been neglecting a relationship with God. You know that you're not close to him. So you're trying to pray in faith, but you have that whisper in the back of your head that's creating doubts. Can anybody relate to that? Has anybody ever done that? I have. Like, God, I really want you to come through. Years ago, this happened to me. I was talking to God about my wife, Brenda, and, uh, and she, she didn't do anything wrong. I was just stupid. But I, I just felt like she wasn't submitting an issue in our marriage to me. And I was new in my faith, and I read the, like, you know, uh, Wives, submit to your husband. I couldn't wait to show that to her and just, mm, you know. And uh, so I'm like, I can't wait to show her how wrong she's been. And I'm talking to God, and he just rebuked me. He said, well, well that's funny, Rob. So you, you want your wife to submit to you, huh? He said, but you won't submit to me. He said, I've been telling you to change some things in your life, and you haven't listened, so you need to stop worrying about other people and watch your own bobber. Can I get an amen on that one? So sometimes we're praying, but we know that he's not going to hear our prayers because deep inside we're in rebellion. So we're praying, but we can't pray in faith. So that's one key thing. Here's the other thing I want to ask you. Christianity, uh, well, I hope you all get this one right. Is it religion or relationship? relationship? Amen. You guys got it right. Good job. Derek is going to take you all out for Dairy Queen afterwards. So. So. And by the way, his bill for his family is probably not much bigger than it would be for all of us. So. So just remember that I said, or you guys said, it's a relationship, right? Like, we admit that, okay? And here's what happens for a lot of people. A lot of people want the benefit of a relationship without the expectations or responsibility of a relationship. Jesus said, you are my friends if you do whatever I command. That's a condition to that relationship, right? John said, whatever we ask from God, we receive because we keep his commandments and do what's pleasing to God. There are prayer conditions. Did you know that? There are conditions to having your prayer answered. If we want to get what we ask for, we have to meet some conditions. And the opposite is true. If we're not keeping his commandments or not pleasing him, then we can have no assurance he's going to hear our prayers. I think in our culture today, we act like God is obligated to answer our prayers. We're just praying all the time. It's like, God, you're up there. You're our big Santa Claus in heaven. I'm just going to do whatever we ask of you. But if we choose not to be in a relationship with God, why would he answer our prayers? Didn't we all just agree that it's a relationship and not religion? How many people in our culture today who have nothing to do with God will say, hey, I'm praying for you. Or a tragedy will hit. We see our politicians. You don't know anything about Christ in life, but man, all of a sudden something will happen and they're praying publicly. But at other times, they don't go to church. They don't pray. They don't praise God. They don't read or obey his word. But on a drop of a dime, when trouble comes, they assume that God's going to hear their prayers. But that's very illogical. And I'll give you an example. Let's say I go fill up my gas tank, I get there, put in $65 in the Kia, and then I'm like, oh, oh no, what? I can't find my wallet. Oh, man. So I go in and I ask the clerk, I'm like, man, I don't have my wallet, but would you pay my $65 gas bill? What do you think is going to happen? He ain't going to do it. He's going to look at me like I'm crazy, probably, right? But I believe this, if I were to call Jesse... Or if I were to call Derek or one of you and said, man, I got to the gas station. I went to fill my tank and I can't find my wallet. I'm stuck here with the bill. I believe that you would probably come help me. Why would you help me and the clerk wouldn't? Because we have relationship. See, it's a game changer, isn't it? 
And that's what changes everything. It's about relationship. And, the, and here's the thing with God, is that God works on the same level. The economy of God is relationship with him if you want to get things. God has no obligation to answer our prayers, those that reject that relationship. We saw that 1 John chapter 3 said that, but here's some other examples. Now listen to this. I, I've asked people certain things that are Christian. I'll say things like, does God hate? And they're like, no. I'm like, well, the Bible teaches it. And I've asked people like, is there times where God would not hear your prayer? I've had people say that God will always hears our prayers. I'm like, well, you need to read your Bible. So here's one example here. Okay? Your sins have separated you from God so that he will not hear your prayers. Proverbs 15, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to God, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. There's Proverbs 15 again, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. And let's continue. The one who turns away his ear from hearing God's word, even his prayer is an abomination to God. And some would say, well, that's Old Testament. Okay, here's the New Testament verse for you. Whoops. New Testament right there. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Here's Isaiah. It says, your new moons, your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They're a trouble to me. I'm weary of burying them. This is all the religious stuff they're doing, right? He said, when you spread out your hands, I will hide my face from you. Even you make many prayers, I will not hear you. Your hands are full of blood. Wash your hands. Make yourself clean. Put away evil doing before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless and plead for the widow. Here's some more. This one's crazy. Think about what he said to Jeremiah. He said, don't pray for these people nor lift up a cry or prayer. Don't make intercession for them because I am not going to hear you. He says it again in Jeremiah 11. He says, do not pray for these people. Don't lift up a cry. Don't pray for them. I will not hear them. Okay. I'm just going to say this. Did you know that all prayers, God doesn't hear all prayers, nor will he answer all prayers? He's not going to answer all prayers. And what's funny is, it's not that he does. I think he wants to. But often the times I want God to answer the prayers, the same people say, God, I want nothing to do with you. I want you out of my life. I have no desire for you. Oh, God, I'm in trouble. Would you help me? God's like, well, you don't want me. You've rejected me. There you go. So if we want our prayers answered, be in a relationship with God. Because here's the thing. He loves the prayers of his children. He loves your prayers when you're in right relationship. It's precious to him. Let's continue. John says, whatever we ask, receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases in his sight. Conditions to prayer there. We have to do what's pleasing. It says his commandments that we should believe on his son, Jesus Christ, love one another as he's given us commandment. So he's saying, if you want to have confidence when you pray, there's four things you have to do. You got to please God, keep his commandments, believe in Jesus, and love one another. That's pretty simple, right? Let's talk about believing with Jesus. That's one of the commandments. This is more than intellectual assent. To believe in Jesus is to believe in everything that Jesus said. Would you all agree with that? And Jesus said the same thing. He said this. He's like, why do you call me Lord, Lord? And not do what I say. He's saying, it's illogical that you say that you believe in me and don't do the things. And here's what it comes down to. A lack of obedience is actually revealing a lack of belief. Did you know that? That's what it really is. So if you say you believe in Jesus, awesome. That's going to open up a lot of other things. Another one they said here, and this one is tough, man. I am so... Mm. Lately, my, my flesh has been wanting to rise up in me. So just pray for me, okay? Um... We have to love one another. And I said, there's two things I want this church to be known for. I want to be known to love well, and I want to be known to be a theologically deep church. Because I think if we get those two things right, everything will be okay. But man, there's so much division amongst Christians, so many Christians that fight. It grieves the Holy Spirit. It hurts our prayers. I really want us to ask, what does it truly mean? If God said, I'll answer your prayers if you love other Christians, what does it truly mean to love brothers and sisters in Christ? Don't just glaze over that. It's important. Okay? What does love do? Or better yet, what does love not do? I, I tell you what, this was another week. Had nothing to do. This church is going so well. I love you guys. I mean, years ago, I was like, I'm done. I'm going to go get a job at Walmart. You know, like I've had it. But now I'm like, man, I love Renewed Church. I love the future here. But I tell you what, there are some Christians that are no longer part of this church that just crush my heart. They don't love. And it's sad. And it's difficult. But here's the thing. 
Do you think that God is pleased with Christians that are so cruel to one another? Divisive, backbiting? No, he's not going to hear their praise. Like, it's a serious thing. God doesn't like when his kids fight. It's not cool. Is that, that's probably not even a word they use nowadays. Cool, that's like from like the 70s or 80s, but y'all get it. You look like you're about my age, so. The third condition is this. Okay, we have to please God. Living to please God, well, that's huge and somewhat vague, isn't it? Just please God. Oh, that's great. Now, we're really wrapping it up here in four minutes. We'll be done on time, I swear. So we have to do what pleases God. That encompasses a lot of things, and there's a lot of examples. So I want to just discuss a few verses that kind of give you some food for thought on what you can do to please God. One, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So he's saying, hey, you want to please God? Have faith. But here's the thing. If you look at it, it's in Hebrews chapter 11. It's more than having faith to believe in Jesus and that he died for you. The whole chapter is filled with examples that people that did radical things by faith. These are people that didn't just go to church on Sunday with faith. They were stepping out radically with their finances, with their kids, their job, sharing the gospel. They were living a little dangerously with their faith. And if you want to please God, live by faith. Y'all live by faith Monday through Friday? Or do we play it safe? You want to please God? Step out in faith. Peter screwed up, but God loved that he had faith. I'll tell you what, when I play it safe, not much happens. But when I step out, God has showed up big time. Live by faith. We're to live righteously. First Thessalonians says this. He said, I urge you more and more just how you receive and how you ought to please God. That you know the commandments. This is the will of God, your sanctification. You abstain from sexual morality. Romans chapter 8 says, those that are in the flesh cannot please God. First Corinthians chapter 10 says that with most of the people in the Old Testament, God was not pleased their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. They became our examples that we should not lust after the things they did, nor become an idolater. Hebrews chapter 13 says, Don't forget to do good and to share for those sacrifices. Please God. So those give you more things to do. Here's what I would simply say to you and I when it comes right down to it is this. If you want to please God, then you have to know the will of God. I would encourage you to spend time in the word of God daily. Remember God the Father looked down at Jesus, his son. He said, this is my son who I am well pleased. He was pleased with Jesus. So if we want to please God, here's what I would say. You know the old WWJD? Or what would Jesus do? Or maybe we could say, what did Jesus do? If you want to please God, do like Jesus. Because he pleased his Father. And if you do what Jesus did, you'll please God and he'll hear your prayers. Now, when I talk about pleasing God, I am not referring to perfection. Don't get caught up in that loop. Okay, I'm not referring to perfection. I would say this. Remember, God is a father who loves you. He's pulling for you, and he's not against you. When I look at my kids, I don't expect them to be perfect, but I am pleased when they see that they make a genuine effort. So you make a genuine effort with God. Be genuine, and you'll please him. Then the last thing here as we close it out in prayer, he said this. He who keeps my commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit he's given us. He's saying, if you keep my commandments, it shows you're actually mine. And, and here's how you can know that I'm in you and you in me because I'm going to give you my spirit. It says this right now, that the Holy Spirit is actually the seal or guarantee of your salvation. Now, this is the one that we've said many times. You want to know whether you're pleasing God, a child of God, if you've been born again, faith only saves. But if you truly believed... You will be regenerated by the Holy Spirit, and there will be evidence of that. But so many Christians just ignore that. I would encourage you over and over, don't rely on subjective feelings to determine whether or not you have the Holy Spirit. Rely on the Word of God and look for the evidence of the Spirit of God in your life that you're a child of God, and you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt. Next week, we're going to do 1 John chapter 4. We're going to get through this book. It'll be like two, three years by the time I get through it. But no, we're getting there, chapter 4. I hope you guys really take this to heart. And here's the thing. When I look at many of you, I know many of you, man, you're right. Like, you love John's letter. Many things that we talked about, I see in your life. But like I always say, it's not our job just to get truth and keep it inside. Take this truth to somebody who needs it. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. Oh, Lord, uh, uh, so much to consider there in our life. But Lord, there's just so many things also that are amazing. The fact that you're a God that does hear our prayer is, is unbelievable. Lord, we do want to please you. We want to seek you and obey you. 
But Lord, I pray that we never caught in that trap, that we do it because it's a, a means to an end, but rather we want to please you and we want to pray to you because, Father, we want to be in relationship with you because we love you the way that you loved us. So, Lord, change our lives for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.